My name is Megan Burnside, and I'll be your moderator this afternoon. I'm a senior marketing manager at LexisNexis, um, who happens to be the sponsor of today's webinar. As you can see, LexisNexis is an industry leader providing information professionals with access to premium news, business, and legal content. More than 90% of Fortune 500 companies use LexisNexis and rely on us to help them make more informed, fact-based decisions and strategies. Today, I'm joined by three esteemed panelists. We have Dr. Alan Abitbal, Assistant Professor of Public Relations at the University of Dayton here in Dayton, Ohio. Joe Shields, Partner and Senior Counselor at Wordsworth Communications in Cincinnati, Ohio. And Thomas Steckel, Global Head of Evaluation and Insights at LexisNexis in London, England. Uh, you can find more detailed information about our panelists on their LinkedIn pages, but I wanted to give you a brief overview so everyone can get acquainted. First, Alan Abitbal. Alan is more than 10 years of communication and PR experience, or spanning corporate communications, government relations, and entertainment and agency PR. Since transitioning to academia, he has been published in the Online Journal of Communication and Media Technologies and has presented at several conferences on the topics of corporate social responsibility, social capital, and social media. Next, we have Joe Shields, who has managed a host of crisis communication scenarios over the course of his 30-year career, ranging from workplace shootings and lightning strikes to college hazing incidents and leadership shakeups. He also counts a long career in politics, which, as we all know, finds itself in a near perpetual state of crisis. And last but certainly not least, we have Thomas Steckel. With more than 20 years of experience in marketing communications research and executive leadership, Thomas helps clients make sense of their social media footprint and how that affects perception and reputation on a global scale. Prior to joining LexisNexis, he was a group director and global analytics lead at WTO Group and managing director at Report International, which happens to now be Salience Insight. Alan, Joe, and Thomas will kick off with brief presentations drawing from their um, individual areas of expertise. We'll then open it up to Q&A with the panelists, which will be the bulk of our time spent today. We'd like to hear from all of you on the call about lessons learned and best practices as we address any specific challenges you're facing. So definitely ask us questions via the chat box and, and submit those questions to the host of presenters um, on the right-hand panel of your screen. We'll be reading your questions uh, throughout the presentation and, and near uh, the Q&A section. We will start to address those questions to the individual speakers. If you have a particular panelist that you want to address, uh, uh, let us know which panelist you want to answer the question. I'm also inviting everyone to participate in our poll. We have a poll up there right now that's asking about digital and social media that should be appearing in the right-hand side of uh, your WebEx. Uh, so feel free to or enter your response to that poll, and we will share the results midway through the presentation today. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it over to Alan to get us started with the theory-based principles that guide crisis communication. Thank you, Megan. Um, when dealing with a crisis, when handling a crisis, there's really two critical points in time that organizations and companies need to pay attention to. Um, pre- and post-crisis. And when I mention pre-crisis, I really mean the day-to-day -day activities that an organization does in order to be prepared and assess where they stand when a crisis occurs. One, um, one model, a theoretical model that can help organizations and practitioners, communication, communicators and marketers with that is a threat appraisal model, which really provides guidance for practitioners to understand where their organization stands with um, conversations and, and chatter um, throughout various media forms, assess what those conversations are, threats or issues, and then arrive at a desirable stance for the organization. This can be done through environmental scanning, which is the um, overall idea of understanding and listening to the conversations being held and had um, about your organization and your industry. Uh, more specifically, issues tracking and management, which looks, like, looks at the specific issues that um, may affect or be affected by your organization and understanding coming up with a, 
um, a way to manage and tackle those issues. Um, assessing reputation, the, there is a lot of research that shows that how an organization prepares and tackles a, a crisis actually affects reputation. Specifically, um, and in some, some examples of this, uh, BP, uh, BP, the way they handled their, their crisis with the BP oil spill obviously um, negatively affected their reputation. While on the other hand, in the 1980s, Johnson & Johnson and Tylenol, the way they handled their, um, the tampering uh, crisis um, positively impacted reputation. And then lastly, um, the creation of a crisis plan. I'm going to get in the next slide, I'm going to talk about specific ways to make sure that an organization is organized, but specifically being prepared and having a plan in place for any kind of crisis is really important. Um, as I'll mention in a couple of slides here, all, all plans are contingent on what the crisis is. However, being organized and, um, and ready for a crisis is of the utmost importance. Next slide. So in detail, to ensure on a day-to-day -day basis an organization and a company is prepared for when a crisis occurs, it is of utmost importance to monitor and understand the conversations occurring throughout media, uh, social and traditional. Uh, the first step in order to do that is when you are um, deciding to monitor and appraise what is happening um, is defining why you're monitoring. Um, a lot of companies understand the need to monitor, but don't fully come out with it with a organized and proactive strategy. Um, it's really important to understand the reasoning why you are um, monitoring. It could be a multitude of things. It could be you're, you want to just listen and, and see what is being said, good, bad, or indifferent, about your organization and industry. You could be doing it to, in order to join the conversation and be part of the conversation. Regardless, there's no right or wrong answer, but regardless of what it is, the reasoning to define your um, objective will dictate how you handle the crisis and how you um, assess the crisis from a communication perspective later on. The first step in that is deciding where and what to monitor. As we all are probably aware of, there are numerous multitude of various platforms that conversation can be occurring socially and traditionally. Um, and a lot of times, a lot of the conversations socially are happening that are, are on places that the organization may not be on. For instance, not every organization is on Snapchat or Twitter, but does not necessarily mean they shouldn't be monitoring those conversations. So understanding where the most important conversations are um, and monitoring those are really important. Now, a lot of conversations are happening at one time, and prioritizing that and understanding um, what to pay attention to most is, is really important. To do that, you can triangulate your, the various conversations and um, set up in various platforms and various um, tools to prioritize by um, maybe looking at, um, looking at conversations that deal with just the organization, or maybe if your organization has a very prominent um, CEO, like a Mark Cuban, um, prioritizing the CEO or even an industry or a product that you are launching. Um, so being able to monitor that and prioritizing that is important. In order to do that, though, developing a plan on how you will assess and understand the various um, conversations and what you will do with those conversations that are, are occurring about your industry and your organization is, is important. Um, one way to do that is by involving others. And what I mean by that is to um, you – some industries and some people on this call may, may be in industries that are of high um, subject matter expertise. And if you're in engineering and a lot of the people who are um, monitoring are communicators who understand their business but may not know the finite details of all the products or industry that um, your organization does. So with that said, involving others and plugging in subject matter experts is really important be able to answer and to um, weigh in on conversations that are occurring about your industry. But to understand this first, it is really important to listen. Where a lot of companies may um, make uh, mistakes, and um, the other panelists may be able to weigh in this later, is that they, they see something occurring, uh, talking about their organization, and they jump in and try to join the conversation without having understanding the climate 
and the conversations around uh, surrounding that, um, that, that comment. So in order to do that, you need to listen and make sure that what is being said is something that you are willing to talk to about but also participate in. Um, but when you participate, it does not necessarily need to be only to answer questions and inquiries and be in, on a negative perspective. A lot of times um, that is where a lot of organizations fail. The best organizations who handle um, social media conversations is really ones who are proactively speaking. And a great example of that is Taco Bell. Um, if, um, if you guys have a chance, I would recommend going to Taco Bell's um, Twitter account. But they actually have conversations, uh, a multitude of conversations with their stakeholders and their audiences and really understand who their audiences are by being playful because most of their audiences are between the ages of 18 and 30. Now their audiences, they have these conversations, they, they weigh in and um, proactively talk to them, but what is great about this is that by doing that, it actually helped them with a crisis they dealt with. Um, some of you may remember in 2011, um, there was the Where's the Beef um, crisis where a customer sued the organization, sued Taco Bell for, um, uh, for alleging that they didn't use meat. Well, because they build relationships with their stakeholders in a positive way prior to this, they um, actually were able to have stakeholders and, and audience members be advocates for the organization um, and help prove and support the fact that Taco Bell does use real meat in their food. And, the, and among other activities, their, um, the lawsuit actually was dropped after only two months. So it was a positive win. And lastly, in terms of appraising and monitoring prior to a crisis, it is important to select appropriate tools to match your strategy. And what I mean by that is there's various um, tools and software that you can use to monitor. Um, however, choosing the right one is important, as some people on this call are probably in industries who are um, international. And being able to, um, some platforms actually allow for um, the translation and the monitoring of various languages. And, and more than just the host language, the host company's language. So being able to pick the right tool is important. Now moving on to what happens after a crisis. So a crisis is, is an event, and what you do um, immediately following is really important. One theoretical um, basis that can help uh, guide you is the situational crisis communication theory by Timothy Coombs. What this theory States is that um, all crisis, all the way an or the strategy an organization takes is um, contingent on the um, on what the crisis is, but more specifically on how the public and stakeholders in the media attribute the responsibility of the organization. And the, the attributions will come through three different ways. Um, one, has the crisis happened before, so, and will it likely happen again? So if an organization has dealt with something similar and repeats the same habits that will impact on how the, or how the media and the public respond um, and which will uh, in turn impact the conversations and, and um, turmoil. A great example is BP. Granted, BP never had a spill the way they did prior, but the industry did in Exxon Valdez. So a lot of people attributed BP as overall representing the industry. Um, was the event controllable or uncontrollable by an individual organization? Um, so seeing how controllable it is, was it a natural disaster, something that the organization couldn't um, uh, control, things like that, like Hurricane Katrina affecting New Orleans? Um, items like that are, are, are another question that people attribute the responsibility of the organization. And lastly, did a crisis occur within or external to the organization? Um, if it's something external and something that the organization couldn't handle, that will affect um, public response more than if it's something within and they could handle. Now, um, the theory does state four different types of strategies that an organization can take. One is denial, and this is um, completely uh, removing yourself from what the organization or what the uh, accusations are, similar to what Taco Bell did. Taco Bell um, stated that. They um, do use real meat in their food, and they um, completely denied the accusations, and that worked in their favor. Uh, diminish, this is um, usually done either by stating that it was an accident, uh, maybe like a, a fire that was not preventable in a, in a manufacturing company, 
for evading responsibility and saying that um, they, were, they weren't aware of what was happening and um, they're trying to do what they can to rebuild it. That leads to the third one, which is um, strategies rebuilding. This is when an organization publicly apologizes and does everything they can to take responsibility and or make the, the situation better. Great example is the Tylenol, um, Johnson & Johnson. Although they denied responsibility because um, saying that they put the cyanide in the pills, which they did not, but they did take, they did apologize right away. They recalled the pills and they um, compensated the families and the victims um, involved. And lastly is reinforcement. This is usually to bolster reputation. Um, this is done when an organization, either you may have heard it when an organization claims that they, this is the first time it's ever happened, they have a good reputation. This is also when they ingratiate um, those who, um, the, the public, and thank the public for all the help they've done. A great example of this is Domino's in 2009. They had two employees who um, did some adulterating things to the food, and they um, went ahead and um, not only apologized for it, but then they took corrective action later on by um, having better safety measures and um, employment um, hiring practices in order to uh, mitigate any kind of um, possible future crisis. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Megan. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Joe, you're up next. Great. Uh, thanks, Megan and Alan. I thought that was uh, very informative. Thank you for, uh, for that great information. Um, my uh, presentation is, is, as you can see, called a political telegraph, and it deals with a, um, a, uh, a campaign that we were involved in a few years ago. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, this was a countywide primary election in Kentucky, uh, just outside of greater Cincinnati, so uh, pretty um, – a conservative area of the state. Our candidate was the incumbent. He had been the incumbent for, uh, I believe, four terms, so about 16 years. Uh, opposing him, uh, again, this is a primary, so this is a gentleman in, in the same um, uh, camp as him. And he was a longtime party activist, actually held uh, some rank within uh, the party. And uh, kind of surprised to get uh, primary when you're You've been around for, for four and, and hopefully going on five terms, and we were uh, you know, surprised and disappointed that we would, we would have somebody uh, run like that, but that's the way it goes. Uh, as you know, if you've done politics, when, you, when you're working with the incumbent, uh, you have a long, long record. Uh, lots of things that, that certainly you can trumpet, lots of things that you have to uh, account for, answer to, uh, basically a lot of fodder for a, an opponent. And so that's sort of just setting it up going into this election. Um, so the, the person that we were uh, going up against, uh, again, not, he, was, he was a non-incumbent, but he and his surrogates were very prolific on social media uh, and in the comment sections of traditional media. Uh, and this was before, you know, this is, so this is the, the election would have been in mid-May. The period that I'm talking about would have been earlier in the year, probably January and February. Uh, around here, probably, it, it probably plays out in other parts as well. People don't really start paying attention to these primaries until, you know, April, right? So you don't really do a lot. That's a, the, the pre-April part is where you get out and you walk and you raise money and you, you kind of deal with your base, but it's not a real visible, real public part of the process. However, uh, our opponent uh, saw fit to, to be very active uh, through his uh, social channels, which didn't have much reach. They were, uh, you know, they were not, uh, as we would say, very uh, uh, robust channels. Um, of course, we were on them. They were also uh, very active in the comment sections. Again, our candidate was an incumbent. Uh, he was in the news. When a news story would come out, invariably uh, the, the uh, surrogates would come out and they would you know, get on the comment sections. Um, and again, this is before the more visible efforts like the paid, earned media, direct mail uh, had begun. So what we were able to do uh, through the monitoring was to actually really get a clear sense of how that campaign uh, on the opposite uh, side was going to run, which was a, a gift that you don't often get in, in politics. Um, so next slide, please. So we were able to, to again, to, to, to monitor these things, and we were able to actually adjust our budgets. Uh, as far as what we would mail, how often we would mail, to whom we would mail, but really more, more importantly, to, to develop the message. Now, we weren't, I don't want to give you the impression that we were just following the opposite, or excuse me, the opposing campaign, because that's certainly not the case. 
Uh, but at the same time, you know, being able to, 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 to adjust message and to sort of get out and address an attack before the attack is made is, is, is really a, the gift that keeps on giving. We were able to find that one of the, the, the main things that the opposing camp was attacking us about, or what we knew they were going to attack because we were monitoring them, was about spending. And it turns out that uh, this, the, the incumbent, uh, his political jurisdiction of like, I think it was 35 political jurisdictions throughout greater Cincinnati, he ranked, his, his county ranked second last in spending per capita. So we were able to find this statistic, which was actually published in one of our local newspapers in a great bar graph. And we were able to just use that thing constantly uh, in every direct mail piece on our website and, and got it out there first. Uh, and we were able actually to drop a, a direct mail piece uh, before uh, they were able to really do anything. Uh, and it really was the one piece that everybody could understand because you could look at it and say, well, now you're accusing this guy of spending a lot of money, um, and yet they spend, you know, basically – this is well, the second last or second lowest of anybody. So it was a very powerful graphic, but we would not have been able, we would have found that, we would have used it, we would not have been able to put the weight behind it that we did had we not known that that was the main argument that's going to be used against us. So the nice part about it was we did win 55 to 45 in a race that, frankly, a lot of people expected us to lose. Um, and it was a, a classic case of being able to identify uh, monitoring, use it, using that as a canary in a coal mine to identify um, you know, the, the attacks uh, of the opponents and not only react to them, but actually get out in front of them. Uh, and it was a, a wonderful thing. And that's all I have. Thank you, Joe. Thomas, it's over to you. Uh, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Alan. Uh, a, a great start. Um, just before I go into um, my brief presentation, intro presentation, uh, as part of this webinar, we are running a, um, a polling question. Um, and we're asking, and I can only encourage everybody on, on this call to uh, take part in the poll, do you think digital and social media has changed media relations? Now, to illustrate how things have changed and keep changing in crisis communications. And without wanting to influence that, that, that poll, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about a case that I was involved in um, about two, two and a half years ago. Um, so um, palm oil um, has been a sort of controversial issue uh, driven by Greenpeace and, uh, and other environmental organizations for, for, for quite some time now. Uh, palm oil is a common, commonly used cooking ingredient in, in Africa and in Southeast Asia, but it's also a highly versatile ingredient that's not just used in food, but also in non-food consumer goods, so soaps and shampoo and, and everything. Now, um, that is creating um, and has been creating, um, you know, in increasingly broad uh, livelihood for people in Southeast Asia where um, they, where a lot of deforestation has been happening in, in order to, to build palm oil plantations. Now, the problem with this, uh, with, with those plantations and deforestation is that's, re that's ruining um, the habitat of orangutans. Um, for example, in the Sumatran jungle, and that, that then makes this a highly, highly emotive uh, issue. Uh, and we'll come back to what that actually means in this particular context. Now, for many years, Greenpeace has been uh, criticizing businesses and campaigning uh, against businesses that, that, that use unsustainable palm oil. Um, and um, in 2004, they managed to get a roundtable on sustainable palm oil uh, established, which uh, has a broad range of stakeholders from um, palm oil using businesses um, to companies uh, earlier up in the supply chain to regulators, countries, and so on, uh, and um, international companies, FMCG companies like Unilever and Nestle and others uh, became part of, of, of this roundtable um, organization fairly early on. Um, um, PMG also joined, but not in 2004. That happened in, in I think, end of end of 2010, um, and that was probably in part triggered by uh, two Greenpeace campaigns that were run against um, palm oil users. The first one in 2008 against Unilever, 
um, in particular uh, around palm oil use um, in the in, in the Dove shampoo brand, um, and that has some elements, some early elements, if you want, of of, of social media, the types of of, of social media um, that um, that that would have been uh, that would have been established at the time, which is probably more blogs and forums. Um, and, uh, and not and not very much else. There was a, uh, a second campaign uh, that was run in 2010 against Nestlé, and in this case, food brand KitKat in particular. Um, when 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 you go back and and, and look at the um, sort of specific activities within those two campaigns, you can see there's a significant difference between the 2010 one and the 2008 one because. There is now already a lot more social media activity around the uh, uh, around the KitKat campaign, and um, there were early YouTube videos, um, sort of fake ads that um, that were playing on the on the emotive uh, issues of deforestation of rainforests and so on. Um, and then for a few years, um, it became quiet. Then in 2014, uh, in early 2014. Um, the next campaign kicked off, and, and, and in this case, um, Procter and Gamble were, were involved. And the target was very much the head and shoulders shampoo brand. Now, I was working for a um, social analytics company at the time, and we were doing um, global social analytics projects for, for Procter and Gamble, and that's that's how I got um, personally involved um, in this project, and can talk a little bit about it. So, uh, next slide, please. So we we were going uh, we were doing ongoing uh, global social media monitoring uh, for P&G for a variety of brands and and so what we what what we saw in our monitoring relatively early on were um, some relatively strongly worded messages um, around uh, P&G the corporate brands but then of course also the Head and Shoulders product brands um, related to imagery uh, around uh, deforestation. Southeast Asia, orangutans, and so on, um, and, and, and most of these came um, sort of directly from the from the region in uh, local um, uh, social media channels. Uh, when I say local social media channels, I mean uh, local language on on global channels like um, Facebook and Twitter and so on. Um, and there was relatively early on there was um, there was there, there was a lot of sharing and and engagement. We were reporting that. Um, back to P&G, they were of course very, very interested in, in, in understanding and learning whether or not um, there would be a whether those were isolated incidents or whether there would be some sort of groundswell of, of uh, social sharing and so on. Um, whether or not it would, that uh, those topics would also jump over into uh, traditional media. Um, so we we monitored on an ongoing basis. We could see we could see um, spikes. And, and increase of uh, social media activity. We could also see uh, some spilling over into uh, in, in, into traditional media. And uh, the, 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 the most striking thing uh, about this entire period, and it was a period of about four to five weeks, I think, or four to six weeks, was the increasing use of uh, visuals as, 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 as a means of getting message across. So. Um, if we if we move to the next slide, so here you, here you can see um, some of the examples that were uh, that were being used. Um, there was also um, that there, there was some 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 actual campaigning happening, um, and in this case uh, in the U.S. Um, there was actual campaigning also in, in the 2008 and 2010 campaigns. Um, you had um, Orangutan-clad uh, activists blocking the entrance of the PN of the um, of the Nestle headquarters at the time, and you had something similar happening with Unilever and so on. So in 2014, um, P um, Greenpeace decided to do something slightly different. So um, they hired a helicopter um, and uh, flew to the um, PNG headquarters in Cincinnati. Where you have sort of small twin towers um, as, as as part of the main building, uh, they put huge banners up um, on um, on both buildings, and 
created a lot of traditional media uh, interest for that, of course. It, 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 it became um, mainstream uh, news. It got widely reported uh, as, a, as a publicity stunt. It was, of course, then linked back to all the social media activity that was happening. Um, people were sharing this on social media and, and you know, making fun of, 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 of P&G and, and, you know, how they weren't able to respond and so on. Um, ultimately, you know, this this also turned into a uh, into in, into a legal case because what PNG did there was clearly, um, you know, was was was, uh, was breaking the law, and it it it, it was then uh, persecuted. Even though I I don't think anybody um, was 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 um, uh, I, I think everybody involved in in, in this got got acquitted in the end, but um, there was some sort of legal follow up, um, but. Apart from that sort of traditional media stunt, there was there was a lot more um, emotive uh, visual communication happening on uh, social media. And so, you're on, on, on your bottom left, for example, you have this this picture um, of a, of a woman in a hammock with um, with a baby orangutan. Um, you get um, on, on on the right, you get uh, spoof adverts um, that were that, that were taking. Um, you know, real head and shoulders adverts and, 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 and tweaking them into the negative message and so on. And whilst all of that was happening, um, P&G were starting to and had been negotiating with, with, with Greenpeace and others and, you know, changing activities around their supply chain and so on. But I, I guess one important takeaway from this, and we will come back to this, to this point, is that um, in, in crisis communications and in communications overall, it's no longer just about facts. Um, factually, P&G had been doing a lot of right things and good things behind the scenes, but that didn't actually make any difference with regards to the public perception at this point. And it, it, it sort of points to something that um, within uh, recent, recent discussions around um, political issues in the U.S., but then also very, very recently and topical in, in, in the U.K., around the EU re referendum and um, the emergence of uh, Donald Trump as a politician and so on. A lot of people are talking about a post-factual world. Um, and and this, this situation of having to deal with um, a, 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 a post-factual, volatile uh, communications environment environment makes it incredibly difficult for for organizations to to respond to so we're saying we're talking a lot about having to be prepared but having to to be prepared these days is very very different from what it would have been like five years ten years or, or, or 15 years ago so um, to, to sort of round this up um, if you if you if you show the next image um, there there, there was then um, sort of public acknowledgement, and this goes back to a point that Alan was making earlier about the, you know, the, the four different types of response, cross denial, diminish, rebuild, and reinforce, and so on. For a period of time, PNG chose a fifth response, which, which, which was silence, which doesn't work in, in this sort of post-factual you know, social media, um, you know, fueled communications world. Um, they did then. Um, they, they they did uh, publicly commit to changes in their um, supply chain management um, to 100% uh, sustainable palm oil use and so on. And um, that was then responded to by 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 by, by PNG by you know putting more visually emotive uh, responses out um, that that were then sh shared very very widely by uh, by people. So that, that was sort of the that was the outcome of that very very um, specific and targeted campaign. And um, what we found was that um, a it happened very very quickly, and it happened on a on a broad scale. It happened from an area where um, even though PNG were prepared in in, in terms of uh, you know crisis communications programs, even into into um, understanding how to deal with social media. Um, the fact that this was so highly visually driven that it went through social networks and that it started sort of on the ground in Southeast Asia in, um, in local languages made it very, very hard for them to, to respond to it. And, and one thing um, that we also only learned with hindsight was how 
organized um, that, and, and, and how process-driven that Greenpeace campaign was. So if we can go to the next slide. So um, what, what, what we learned in the process was that um, Greenpeace, um, and, and, and not for the first time in this campaign, is really following a, a, a very strict five-step process, um, which, which, which runs from an initial investigative um, phase um, uh, through to a documentation phase where um, lots of photos are being taken, interviews are being conducted, and, 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 and so on around the, uh, the, the, the particular issue. A lot of evidence is being gathered through a, an exposed phase um, where they go publish for the f uh, public for the first time through um, press conferences, but then also in this case, um, very very targeted uh, social media activities. Um, again, with with prepared uh, adverts and fake adverts and so on. Uh, a fourth stage, which 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 is an an act stage, where um, they they start. Um, leveraging the um, you know local activists a lot more and, and, and drive activation from social media channels and, and engagement through to finally a lobbying um, phase where it's really about taking that momentum that was generated throughout the four stages and, and turning that into active change of behavior and commitment from organizations to doing things in a, in a, in a, in a different way. So the whole thing um, taken together is, is called, unsurprisingly, if, 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 if you take the first letters of every word, it's, it's, it's called the ideal approach. Um, and, and, and one thing that we, that we learned from this, this, this um, whole activity is in order to respond adequately to, to such an approach, you have to sort of, you have to mirror that type of structured and systematic and planned approach um, on, on, the, on the side of the, um, of the organization that potentially faces crisis management issues as well. And that's in this case, even though PNG did a lot of the right things, um, <clears throat> that wasn't the case. And that, that meant it took probably longer than necessary um, for, 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 for that crisis to, um, to go away. So the final learnings from this on the, on the, on the next slide, and also just to, to, to queue up the, uh, the more open conversations that we want to have is, um, as an organization trying to, to, to find your bearings in this um, very disruptive and volatile, increasingly social media, um, communications-driven world, you have, you have to understand, uh, understand the mechanic, mechanics of how, these new, how, how new communication works in, in a way, and then you need to respond to that. So in the case of dealing with an organization like Green, Greenpeace, know the use cases, um, know the structured approach they take to these sorts of activities, um, continuously monitor all media channels in, 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 in the broadest possible way to, to, to pick up on signals earlier and understand how to respond. And, you, it, and it's not enough to just do that in English. You really have to do it in local languages as well. Um, be very strategic and systematic in the way that um, you use media. And this goes way beyond crisis communications. This is really about um, data evidence-based communications plans and structures and frameworks that, um, that, that, that help you respond a lot earlier, that, that help you pick up signals a lot earlier to, in order to be able to respond earlier to, to have um, you know, preventative mechanisms and, and activities in place and respond in an adequate way to, to, to keep a crisis whenever it breaks as small as possible. And in, in this particular case of, um, of, of the palm oil issue, it, it's really um, and again, this can be generalized, um, communicate openly and transparently at all times in as far as, as, as your organizational you know, limitations allow that. Um, be supportive of organizations. In this case, you know, this, 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 this roundtable um, organization, you know, be, become a part of that. Publicly comment on how you fix your supply chain. Uh, and, and how you how you listen, how you actively listen, and 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 and, and take, um, you know, draw the right conclusions and, and and take the right action. 
um, and ensure that business leaders are being seen to be taking these issues seriously and have them comment on it, because this is another thing that didn't happen in this case. So these are just a, a few general comments, um, and I now hand, hand it back to Megan, and I look forward to an engaged conversation for the next 20 minutes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, thank you, Joe and Alan, as well. We do have a few questions that are coming in, but just a reminder to everyone on the call, you can send in the question via the chat or Q&A box uh, in WebEx. Also, um, wanted to provide an update on the poll results. So, not surprisingly, um, about 90% of the respondents said that digital and social media has changed media relations dramatically. So 90% of uh, people answering the polling said dramatically. And so when we think about that, Alan, I'm gonna send the first question your way. When it comes to monitoring media and news coverage, so monitoring the gamut, whether it is traditional media, but also social media, uh, setting up search terms is very important. So how do you decide which ones to use? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously there is multitude of search terms you could use. Obviously the very most basic one would be setting up search terms that have to do with your organization's name and or industry. Um, that's a good start, but then start as the conversation start building around that, um, and I'm talking from the initial setup, then once the conversation start around your organization's name, start filtering out to um, specific industry terms or, or points that you start seeing coming up from various um, conversations and, and comments that people are making in social media, um, but also anything you do from an industry perspective um, or if you have different product lines, setting up terms based off of those as well and anything corresponding with those names would be the best place to start. But then really, it's a, again, it just comes back to listening and, and seeing patterns and then um, identifying what those patterns are and then building search terms based off of those patterns. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Uh, so, Joe, we have a question for you. Um, and this is in relation to a media tracking system. If, you, if you're using a media tracking system and it uncovers negative news uh, within, let's say, print and broadcast traditional media, what can you do about it? What issues should you consider when deciding whether and how to respond? Uh, well, I think the first thing uh, is that I'd be happy I found it. <laughs> you know, that's the nice thing about monitoring, especially in, in an agency setting like we are. Um, you know, the, the, the worst thing in the world would be for a client to find out something that, that uh, you know, before you did. Uh, so I certainly would be glad. But, but basically, I think you'd look at, at two things um, when it comes to that kind of situation. You'd really look at process and you would look at content. Um, from a process standpoint, I'd want to know why we didn't know the article was being written. Uh, you know, we have very stringent um, policies and procedures that we put in place with our clients. They're not always followed, especially by the media, but the idea is that if there is a media inquiry, you know, it sort of sets off a, a, a trigger and a system comes into place where we want to be able to talk to that reporter and kind of find out what they want, find the right person within the client. Um, and we certainly, if there are phone calls that come in, uh, you know, I mean, a reporter can call anybody in an organization. They can, you know, they, they're, they're as accessible as anybody. What we'd like for them to do is to, to direct those calls to us, and then that, that triggers it. Now, we know that that's, that's you know, not always going to happen, but still I would want to know where it broke down um, to really get back and, and, and see what you could do um, about fixing that. You know, and I, I would also like to, to talk to the reporter because really so many times – we, whether you're internal or external, when you're in the PR position, reporters, even though they, they don't like to admit it a lot, really need uh, and can, can really be helped by the kind of uh, assistance we can provide, whether it's background information or making sure they're talking to the right person, even scheduling, those kinds of things. And most reporters are, are you know, are, are fine with that system. We're not there to try to get in the way or spin or anything else like that. We really want to help them. So from a process standpoint, I would certainly uh, want to know. From a, from a content standpoint, you know, I think it's, it's just like any other uh, negative article. Um, you know, you want to, what's the overall tenor? Is it accurate? Um, but really, a lot of times what happens is 
one of the things that you really got to take into consideration is what kind of traction the story is likely to have. Uh, you know, there's a, an old adage that I think works here, and that is, you know, first do no harm. If you are, if there's a small story that comes out and, you know, maybe it rubs you the wrong way a little bit, and then you spent, you know, three or four news cycles trying to fix it, well, all you're doing is giving it, you know, greater length uh, or greater depth, rather, for, uh, for people to see it. Um, you know, if it's wrong, then we're going to call a reporter and say, hey, it's wrong. You know, you need to fix this. Um, so, you know, really that kind of triggers just a regular media relations response uh, from a content standpoint. But, uh, you know, again, from the process standpoint, that stuff really bothers us when, when, when articles come out that, that we weren't, uh, you know, expecting to come. I mean, we can't control it, but we're certainly going to go back and find out uh, if there's something we can do to, 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 you know, prevent that from happening the next time. Okay, great. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Thomas, we have a question for you. How do you measure the successes or failures of a crisis communication effort? Okay. Um, well, data is key to that question, of course. Um, you know, monitor, monitor and evaluate continuously all your all your key media channels and and your outlets. You know, the ones the ones that really matter to your brand. And you, you really have to do that. Um, across your channels um, these days, um, you know you have to you have to understand um, when and where and how responses are being required, uh, and then you also have to understand when 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 things go back to normal. I think the the key point about all of this is, and we said this before, is you have to be prepared. So it's one thing to switch on your windscreen wipers when a rain, you know, when raindrops hit your your windshield, but in a sense, for crisis communications, that's that's too late. So um, you really have to to stick with that analogy, and I'm borrowing this from from somebody who used it at a crisis communications seminar many years ago. So you really have to understand cloud formations, and you have to monitor cloud formations so you can then start navigating around the rain risk. That's that's how you need to. That's how you need to look at, uh, at, at, at crisis communications. And uh, so, you know, coming back to the, to the, to the monitoring aspect here, um, you know, you have to really monitor across premium print, newspapers, magazines, broadcast channels, online news, blogs and forums, social networks these days. And even then, it's not just the written word you need to look at in many cases, but you also have to look at images and video these days. You have to be aware of what's being discussed, where those discussions are happening, how they relate to your brand, and also include wider topics in the industry that could that could impact your brand. Um, so, for example, if you're an internationally operating airline, you know, of course, you're interested in what your passengers have to say about the experience of flying with you and whether or not they like the food and was the seat comfortable and and and, and so on. And you also want to know. Um, where you rank and where you sit in terms of perception, satisfaction rate, and so on against your against your main rivals. But at the same time, you also need to know about regulatory issues, about open sky policies, about flight safety, environmental issues, and so on. And again, for all of that, data is absolutely critical and data is key. Um, you need to be able to benchmark for all these issues. So, so you have points of comparison, reference, and 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 the context. You and in order to find, you know, those those those, those key aspects, those, those key points that can trigger a crisis early, you have to embed your crisis monitoring in a, in a really wider context of, you know, continuously being aware of, of what's happening in the media. As you do that, you can then set up trigger systems and alert trigger systems that get activated according to whatever you whatever rules you define. You know, a ceiling and a floor of how positive or how negative the, the, the news flow is. A, a, a certain emotive words and adjectives are being used. You know, can you can you see some sort of anomaly in your in your news flow? That's that's the way how you how you you know that, that's that's how you pick up whether or not something is going to hit pre-crisis and then post-crisis. Once you've responded and once the crisis has gone through that certain uh, you know through a certain uh, trajectory, when you know you're on the on the on on the, on, on the declining side, um, and the crisis is you know is already diminishing. You really have to continue your monitoring and looking at your data in order to understand uh, whether or not additional response is, is required, or whether or not you're at a point where you can actually breathe a sigh of relief and say, okay, we are we are now on the 
on the right side. And we can now start preparing for the next crisis because there will always be a next crisis. Thanks, Thomas. Um, the next question uh, is for you, Alan. So I think in your uh, pre upfront presentation, you were talking about Snapchat and monitoring some of those conversations. Would love for you to kind of chat a little bit more about that and, and specifically about uh, partic also participating, so not just monitoring, but participating in, in conversations that are happening online and through social media. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, Snapchat is, is interesting, obviously, because you know, technically the conversation kind of goes away, so it's a little harder to um, to monitor it. And unfortunately, on most most social media um, monitoring sites such as a Hootsuite, Nuvi, and there's a multitude of other ones don't really capture Snapchat. But the best way to be on Snapchat is to um, uh, just kind of watch the overall patterns of, of what is being talked about. And then in terms of participating, it's really knowing the, knowing the, the medium and the platform. Um, and Snapchat's a great example of that in terms of there's a lot of companies who do really good things on Snapchat by, um, I mean, typically people who are on Snapchat like to either use the filters or to um, more from a, a – um, the, uh, a visual, that's what we're looking for, a visual um, perspective. And so companies who kind of can have fun with their brand, um, it's, they're the ones who are really good at participating on Snapchat, but it's just in general with, participa with participation in, um, on social media, um, Twitter and Facebook, Facebook still being the dominant one, but Twitter and Facebook really are where um, the majority of organizations are at this point. And um, it's really – just knowing the medium, knowing who's using the medium and which stakeholders and publics are on those mediums, um, and then just being part of that conversation. And I think that's the most important thing. Um, and when I say being part of that conversation, it doesn't necessarily mean you only have to answer questions. Um, it is does take a lot of time, and it is kind of a full-time situation to always be talking, but a lot of um, the – a lot of various different platforms and monitoring services allow you to have a chat function and you can schedule your chats in them. So Twitter and Facebook specifically, a lot of the tools that I have used in the past, you can kind of schedule conversations that um, elicit participation. And what I mean by that is you know, listening to what the conversations are, putting um, a question or, or a comment that kind of goes with the flow of what the conversation is, but also asking questions getting people involved, having people visit various parts of your um, websites maybe or your um, of various products you're doing or sweepstakes, various things like that. And that's really the best way to participate and engage because that at least builds up this, what I was mentioning before, relationships with your publics, which then can become advocates when a crisis occurs. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, Joe, we have a question. Quick question for you. How do you handle a rogue stakeholder who criticizes an institutional response? Uh, okay, let's think about this for a second. So I'm assuming the criticism is going to come through uh, some kind of social or digital channel. Um, so I think the first thing we would want to do is see what we could find out about them you know, to see if, uh, if, if this is a person that is for example, uh, a very uh, influential blogger or somebody that, that is very active in the social space. I mean, so it would be nice to get a little bit of data to find out who they are. I think one of the things that really though underpins this is that there's no such thing as like a really clean uh, crisis. You know, I mean, one of the first things we tell clients is that, look, you know, you're going you're, you're gonna to get a little bit. You know, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, I shouldn't say it doesn't matter. It matters a whole lot. But the reality is that, that you have to be prepared for, for taking a, you know, a bit of a thrashing in any kind of a, of a, a crisis situation. Something's gone bad. And you know, your, your degree of responsibility um, is what it is, but there's nothing that I can do as a practitioner that's going to be able to wipe the slate clean. And it's really important that clients understand that because it, it helps to inform the kinds of things that you can do. So from a, when, you, when you have you know, a rogue stakeholder uh, you know, maybe blasting you in the comment section of a newspaper or something, you know, our instinct would be to hold fire on that. Uh, as I said earlier, one of the things that's really important to keep in mind is that you don't want to uh, perpetuate uh, a negative comment. I mean, if somebody gets on there and calls you a clown or something, 
you know, well, okay, hopefully it's going to, you know, scroll away here before too long. If they persist, if it's somebody that really has a record, um, there's a lot of different ways to do that. If it's a specific issue that perhaps you can participate in the, in, in the, um, in the conversation and address, there's ways offline to do that. So, you know, not surprisingly, there's a lot of caveats to how you would do it. But I think the main things are, number one, don't, you know, don't make a, a small deal a big deal. Um, understand that not everybody's going to agree with you. Uh, and, and you're just going to get it in the, in, in the uh, context of a crisis. And the third thing is try to find out what data you can about them um, and kind of let it fly. I mean, usually in a situation like this, our instinct would be to, to, to not do anything um, and, and monitor it and make sure that it's not anything that's going to fester. Um, but, you know, it's a small price to pay. One person giving you some grief through a, through a digital channel, you sometimes just have to take that. Thank you, Joe. Uh, this is Megan again, and we are at 1.58, so we're going to wrap up our webinar for today. So I wanted to thank you all for attending the webinar, for your time and your thoughtful questions. We weren't able to answer all of your questions, but we will send out responses uh, via email. Uh, we hope you've gained some really valuable tips and strategies that you can apply when you experience a crisis or as you're uh, planning uh, to prepare for a crisis. Just a real quick note that LexisNexis does have a media monitoring solution. It's our LexisNexis News Desk, a service from LexisNexis that helps you search, analyze, monitor, and share media intelligence in one platform. We hope that you'll join us again for future LexisNexis webinars. Stay tuned for announcements about our upcoming events. And thank you to all three of our fantastic panelists today.